Good morning. Welcome to Reformed Presbyterian Church. Uh, we are glad that you can be here this morning to worship alongside us. What a beautiful summer morning. Get ready for real summer next week. <laughs> Actually, I don't know. Some of the, the calendar people might know that technically summer doesn't start until Thursday officially. But I say if you're out of school, it's summer. So it's been a good summer day. Today is Father's Day, and we are blessed at RPC to have many wonderful, godly fathers in our midst. Can we quickly give them a round of applause? And we all have a perfect heavenly father, and it's him that we come to worship this morning. So won't you join with us as we approach God in his word. Good morning. Let's approach the word. Let's approach God in word. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. In a just and little while, the wicked will no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. Dear Heavenly Father, what an honor and privilege it is to come before you and call you our Father. By your grace, through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, you have adopted us as your sons and daughters. As our Father, you have promised to never leave us or forsake us. Your love endures forever. We ask you now, Lord, to quiet our hearts and minds from the distractions, cares, and burdens of this world and that our worship and praise be truly honoring to you. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see your truth. Speak to our hearts as we come before you now in corporate worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please rise as we sing hymn 115.
remain standing as we confess our sin in unison. Almighty God, who is rich in mercy to all those who call upon you, hear us as we come to you humbly confessing our sins and transgressions and imploring your mercy and forgiveness. We have broken your holy laws by our deeds and by our words and by the sinful affections of our hearts. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. Grant that we may hereafter serve and please you in newness of life. Through the merit of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please repeat as we sing the songs of worship.
please remain standing and take a moment to greet those around you. Well, welcome once again to Reformed Presbyterian Church here in Ephrata. We are glad that you are here. If you are visiting with us this morning, we would like to extend a special welcome. I see a few visitors. Uh, we're glad that you are here to worship with us. Uh, the ushers are coming around handing out the uh, attendance registers. Uh, please, uh, please let us know that you were here worshiping with us this morning. And if you are a visitor, we do have a small gift for you out in the narthex. Uh, the narthex is a church word for the lobby, in case anyone wondered where that is. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, invite Nick Klein to come up to recognize our uh, 2024 graduates. All right, good morning. I uh, have a nice group of graduates, both high school and college. What I think I'll do is when I announce your name, if you can come on up here. Uh, we do have some cards for you. We will also, we also have a small gift for most of you that we will be getting to you here at some point. Um, gonna, as I announce each person, I'm going to share a little bit about what they're up to post-graduation. Uh, so I'm going to start with Atticus. So Atticus Wright, he's a 2024 graduate of Ephrata High School. Uh, he's planning on working for the family business, E.W. Wright Lawn Care, after graduating. I can't get him to mow my lawn. I haven't been able to yet, but hopefully, you know, eventually we'll get there. Uh, William Weaver over there, he plans to study mechanical engineering at a local college and then finish up, Lord willing, at my alma, alma mater. We are Penn State. So love to see that. Uh, he is open to the Lord's leading one year at a time, though, so he's going to see how, how things shake out. Uh, Moving on to the college graduates, so Kale Erfogey is graduating with a BS in Data Science and Analytics from Thomas Edison University. You may have, you may be thinking to yourself, didn't he just come up last year? So yeah, he, he did. He graduated from high school last year, graduated from college this year. Um, right now, he is interning at Ephrata National Bank, and I hear his boss is a really good guy. <laughs> and then... Last but not least, Jasmine Weaver. Uh, she's graduating with a BS in civil engineering with a minor in math, so super smart if you're a minor in math, from the York College of Pennsylvania. She has accepted a position at Lochner in Camp Hill as a roadway design engineer. So next year, when you run into a pothole, you know who to blame. <laughs> she hopes to travel a little bit before she begins her career. So um, can, I, can we do a quick round of applause for our grads? And if 
you'll join me in a quick word of prayer before I hand out the cards. Father, thank you for these four individuals. We thank you for their, their, their studiousness. We thank you for their parents who have raised four great young adults, and we pray that you will continue to bless them as they start their college career or their, uh, their real career, and we pray that you will use their gifts for your glory and honor, uh, and may they uh, be a light in the world wherever they may be. In Jesus' name. Thanks, Nick. And congratulations to all the graduates. Now, if you join with me, we'll pray again. Uh, we have quite a few uh, prayer requests uh, in our bulletin. You can uh, please take a look at those and keep uh, those people in your prayers. Let's uh, pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you this morning grateful and thankful that you are our Father, that you are a gracious and forgiving and loving God who forgives us our many sins and shortcomings, who watches over us every day in, in a thousand ways we can't uh, recognize or even uh, often fail to give you uh, the glory and credit for. We know that we are sinful and frail, uh, easily led astray. We pray that you Gently guide us and correct us and lead us into the way of life, into the way of your son, Jesus. Thank you for these graduates. Pray that you would bless them in their next endeavors and they, that they would most of all seek to, to follow you with their whole heart. We lift them up to your care and know that uh, you will lead and guide them in the way. We have many people dealing with various health issues, and we, we lift each one of them up to you. Um, we think of uh, David Voss recovering from his second uh, amputation surgery uh, this week. We just pray for uh, continued healing and for energy as he recovers from uh, two major surgeries close together. Thank you that uh, you lead and guide him. Just pray that you give him peace as he uh, begins the slow uh, road of recovery. Uh, we think of uh, Chris Thomas as she has... Uh, just dealing with uh, many health issues and uh, looking at uh, additional testing for uh, radiation treatments. Uh, just be with the doctors and be with Fred and Chris as they walk through this uh, challenging time. Give them grace for, for each day. Uh, be with those going, undergoing uh, just long-term uh, health issues and health challenges. Be with those whose fathers have gone on to heaven on this Father's Day as they think back and reflect on, on the lives of their fathers. Be with those who, whose earthly fathers may have fallen well short. Uh, pray that they would be comforted knowing that they have a perfectly perfect heavenly father in you. Uh, we lift up Emmanuel as he uh, wraps up his, his trip in uh, Uganda and Kenya and flies home, I think tomorrow or the next day. Please give him traveling mercies as he, as he travels back. We lift up our, our time of uh, worship this morning. Be with me as I preach in a few minutes that uh, they would be your words and not mine. We thank you for this morning. Thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, the ushers will be coming forward to collect the offering.
Thank you, Janelle and Courtney. Well, it is my privilege to be with you again this morning. It's been a little bit since I've preached, uh, but we are going to stay in the Beatitudes. This is now our fourth week and third Beatitude, if you're keeping track. And uh, we will begin in a moment by reading uh, responsibly uh, through the passage. Uh, This is what we've been doing the last uh, few weeks as Tim's been leading us. But he is at Aunt Nettie's, so you get me this morning. Let's begin by by reading responsibly this this passage, the, the Beatitudes. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he came, when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words. May you give us open ears to hear from them this morning, that we would be edified and grow into a deeper understanding of your will for our lives and your heart towards us. In Christ's name, amen. Like I said, this is the third beatitude we're now at, and uh, Matthew Henry says that these are rightly called paradoxes. They they all should be a little bit jarring to us as we, as we read them. <clears throat> but there's, there's also a logic to the order, and uh, Pastor Tim kind of talked about that the last couple weeks. To be poor in spirit is to recognize your poverty and sin, that, as Luther says, all of life is repentance. And that should lead to mourning, to a godly mourning over your sin, not merely a pity party. And then God provides comfort and the strength that we need through Jesus. Now flowing out of that is today's beatitude. The meekness that flows from being poor in spirit where we mourn for our sin. They all kind of go together. The meek man knows he's a sinner. and He's therefore able to hear about how he's a sinner without getting upset. He can be concerned about others and not constantly striving for his own glory. Meekness, God-centered, if it's God-centered, has a glory in God rather than self, and it's the true source of blessing and inheritance, as we'll see. And there's kind of this this standard formula for each one of the Beatitudes. It starts with blessed, then there's a description of what is blessed, and then there's a promise associated with that blessing. So ours is blessed are the meek. R.C. Sproul, just by way of reminder, says that the, this blessing is more than mere happiness. Some, some translations of the Bible say happy. And I would kind of agree with uh, R.C. that happy seems a little, it doesn't carry enough freight in the English language for what is being talked about. Uh, R.C. Sproul says it's more thinking about the beatific vision. This is a looking upon God face to face and that he gives us peace. This is the true blessing. Uh, and and Really what might be in mind here is the Old Testament blessing, that great uh, benediction from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That's the kind of blessing that we're talking about. Sproul again says, to be blessed of God is to receive spiritual benefit from him that lasts forever. And this is what Jesus is pronouncing upon these various groups, 
these beatitudes. So we're going to look at three main things. What meekness isn't, because that's important. What meekness is and what it does. And then lastly, the promise given to the meek. So the first, what meekness isn't. What's the first word that comes to your mind when you hear the word meek? I think rhymes with weak. So is meekness weakness? Meekness has the unfortunate coincidence of really sounding a lot like weakness in the English language. And so it's, a, it's an easy uh, association. I'm going to be honest, when I looked at the calendar and I looked at what's, uh, what beatitude I was getting and the fact that it fell on Father's Day, reminding fathers to be meek made me cringe just a little bit because of this, this word association. Now, are we saying that fathers should be weak? By no means, right? If anything, we, we want to call men and fathers especially to strength. But we can kind of see how this gets confused. Think of some of the other words that are often associated with meekness. Actually, dictionary.com, if you look up the word meek in the dictionary, or at least on the online dictionary, the words they use are shy and compliant. And some other synonyms would be passive and mild. And the antonym, the opposite, is bold and brave. So in our modern English, meekness is the opposite of bold and brave. And I think part of what's going on here is we've got a word that is shifting its meaning in, in our popular culture. I can think of other words that have done that. The most obvious might be the word gay. Gay, once upon a time, meant happy. Somehow. And that seems utterly strange to me. It quickly became a word to describe homosexual relationships. And because it's describing something abhorrent, it also became a, a slang or a, an insult. And so you have a word that used to mean happy, now meaning an insult. Meek's a little bit like that. Meek goes from being something very good to kind of sounding sort of like something maybe you don't really want to do. Hitler, of all people, this is one of the things that he found so distasteful about Christianity. In his, in his nationalist socialist project, he, he complained that we have the misfortune to have the wrong religion. Why didn't we have the religion of the Japanese regard sacrifice for the fatherland as the highest good? Even Islam would have been more compatible to us than Christianity. Why did it have to be Christianity with all its meekness and flabbiness? But Hitler didn't inherit the earth, did he? He inherited bullets. So is it, does meekness mean cowardice? It can't, because in the Bible we're told, in, actually in Revelation 21, eight, uh, verse 8, it says, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, the second death. So meekness cannot be cowardice. It cannot be the opposite of brave. It certainly doesn't mean effeminate, because being soft and effeminate, as 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 tells us, means that you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So where is the disconnect? I think it comes largely from the fact that meekness can look weak to the outsider, to someone who doesn't understand the whole picture, what's going on internally in someone who's being meek. Think about Matthew chapter 5, just a few verses later on in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus talks about this law of retaliation and says to turn the other cheek, to not resist the evildoer. That's what meekness looks like fleshed out. Or a couple verses later in verses 43 through 48, the law of brotherly love, where we're supposed to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That outward action can be confusing. Are they not retaliating or taking vengeance because they are weak? Because they are compliant or timid? So this is the tension. Is this a good passage for Father's Day? Well, of course, because it's in the Bible. <laughs> But it's only if we actually understand what the word means. And I think one of the best ways to, to get a better understanding of it is to look at two of the primary people that are described as being meek in the Bible, to put some flesh and bones on, on kind of a, a squirmy word that's hard to pin down. 
we are told in the Bible that Moses is meek and that Jesus is meek. In fact, in Numbers uh, chapter 12, verse 3, Moses is just, it says, Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. So think Moses, and then think shy and compliant. That doesn't quite match up. Think about what Moses' ministry and life looked like. He challenged Pharaoh, the, the greatest political power in the, in the land, uh, to his face. He worked great signs and wonders and delivered a people out of bondage, walked them through the Red Sea, crushed the army in the sea. Now, obviously, God did a lot of this, but Moses is, is very involved. He leads a recalcitrant people through a desert for 40 long, long years and brings them to the doorstep of the promised land that they're to inherit. And more importantly, God himself spoke to Moses face to face, unlike anyone else. In fact, in Numbers 12, what's being attacked is uh, Moses is being, uh, being challenged in his leadership by his own brother and sister of all people, Miriam and Aaron, mostly because they didn't actually like his wife. That's a whole different topic. Uh, but God defends Moses. Moses does not defend himself. God rushes to Moses' defense and strikes Miriam with leprosy. And what does Moses do in that passage? He actually intercedes to God on behalf of his sister that just questioned his leadership, saying, God, please heal her. Please. That's the mark of a meek man. Consider what Jesus says of himself in Matthew uh, chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. Come to me, all who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The word gentle is the same uh, work, word in Greek, uh, praus, for meek in Matthew chapter 5. So that's the same word. When he says, I am gentle, he's saying, I am meek and lowly in heart. But was Jesus shy and compliant? Hardly. He challenged the Sadducees and Pharisees to their face. He called Herod a fox. Sounds more like something John the Baptist would do, but no, it was Jesus. Do you think the money changers were saying to themselves, here comes that shy, compliant Jesus as he's getting out his whip to drive the money changers from the temple? No, they were running. They were fleeing the premises. But Jesus was gentle among the poor and downtrodden. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He brought prostitutes and tax collectors to repentance. And he dealt with the constant infighting and whining of his disciples, who always, while in the presence of the king of kings, argued about who among them was the greatest. Jesus is Lord. He is the opposite of weak. In fact, in Philippians 2.10, we are told at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So most uh, Bible dictionaries and commentaries will give this standard definition instead for meekness. It's humble. It's gentle. It's not thinking too highly of yourself. Others would say it's strength under control. The word actually comes from uh, the sense of like, the, the root verb, uh, comes from the sense of, of being tamed or bridled, where you have a horse that you're, you're taming and, and now able to use to you know, pull a plow or something like that, um, suitable for productive work. Uh, my dad, I was just talking to him this weekend, and he said as a kid, uh, they had family members who had a farm, and the plow horses were that tame, they could climb up on the they could cl like physically climb the, the plow horse like a jungle gym and get on its back. Like they could climb the back leg. Think about the power in a plow horse. He could have been kicked into eternity and I'd not even be here, right? But that horse is meek. He's been tamed. And so a child could climb it. Now, don't do that. I don't recommend climbing horse, random horses, especially on their back leg. That's a recipe for disaster. However... In that instance, uh, it just shows how, how tame that horse was, that he could, he could tolerate uh, children climbing on him. This is what Jerry Bridges says. Both gentleness and meekness are born of power, not weakness. There is a pseudo-gentleness that is effeminate. 
There's a pseudo meekness that is cowardly, but a Christian is to be gentle and meek because those are godlike virtues. We should never be afraid, therefore, that the gentleness of the spirit means weakness of character. It takes strength, God's strength, to be truly gentle. So then the opposite of meekness, I would say, if meekness is strength under control, the opposite of meekness is strength out of control. It's tyranny and oppression, no matter the scale, whether it's in the household or in the nation. Let's look at the, there's, this word's actually relatively rare. It's only used uh, four times in the New Testament. We've already heard two of them. Uh, the second was in Matthew uh, 11, as I, I mentioned, where Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly, and you will find rest for your souls. I think what he says right after that, for my yoke, for my leadership is easy, and my burden upon you is light. Contrast that with the yoke of slavery in Egypt, where the harsh taskmasters demanded that the, uh, the Israelites make bricks, and then they denied them the straw necessary to make those bricks. That's the tyranny. That's the oppression of strength out of control. Think of the yoke of our slavery to sin. It is also a harsh taskmaster. It demands more and more of us and gives us less and less in return. And finally, it leads to death. Dane Ortland, in his book, Gentle and Lowly, which is about that passage in Matthew 11, describes Jesus as this, meek, humble, gentle. Jesus is not trigger-happy, not harsh, reactionary, or easily exasperated. He is the most understanding person in the universe. The posture most natural to him is not a pointed finger, but open arms. Think again in Matthew 21, verse 5. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. This is Palm Sunday. And how is he described as he rides in on a donkey? It says, in fulfillment of prophecy, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. Even as a king, of all the people, if anyone can think highly of themselves, it's a king. But here Jesus sets the example for all kings, lesser kings that come after him in showing that meekness, that humility. Meekness is a desired quality for kings and rulers. And we'll see an example of that uh, later. A petty or proud ruler who rules as a tyrant is out of step with the Christian ideal. But meekness is not just for Jesus and it's not just for kings. It's not just for men. In 1 Peter 3, verse 3 and 4, Peter is describing the relationships between men and women, and he's giving women a charge for how to conduct themselves in the household. And in verse 3 and 4 he says, Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle, same word, meek, a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Think about how important this gentleness or meekness is in this same context in 1 Peter. In verse 1 and 2 of that same chapter, so if you're in 1 Peter, back up just two verses, and he he exhorts wives to be subject to your own husbands so that even if some of them do not obey the word, meaning the gospel, They may be won over without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So this is, so meekness is incredibly powerful. It can steer steer a dumb guy who will not believe the gospel, but his faithful, meek life may turn even that stubborn head. Meekness can accomplish amazing things. Actually, there's a great example of this. If you know Lee Strobel, Uh, the prominent uh, Christian apologist. He was an atheist early in his life and in his professional career, and he was actually so impressed by his wife's dramatic change. She actually became a Christian a little while before him, and the change in the way she uh, carried herself and just was very attractive and and surprising to him, and it it, it turned a switch in his brain. He said, I need to look in to Christianity and its claims more seriously. 
and that's where you end up writing The Case for Christ, which is a phenomenal book defending uh, the, the, the resurrection of Christ and just the truth of the gospel. But it started with a wife being married to, converting and being married to a, a, a pagan, proud unbeliever, but her meekness uh, helped in God's providence to turn him. So this is not an exclusively masculine or feminine quality. We're all called to this, and if we do it, we're all blessed uh, by it. But it may look different uh, for different people. So what does it look like? We've seen a little bit, uh, but I think we need to look through a couple different facets of what meekness, how it gets directed. First, how, how how is meekness directed towards God? How do we direct it? when looking at ourselves, and then how do we direct it while interacting with others? Those are kind of the main ways we can think about it. Meekness towards God is fundamentally acknowledging God's sovereignty. Meekness is supposed to be power under control. Under the control of who? Who are we tamed by? We're tamed by God. We're under his control. We acknowledge that God has the right to do with us Whatever he wills, and this is convicting to me, that we are complaining or chafing under the hand of God where he has you, it's because we're not meek enough. We could grow in meekness. If we complain, we are saying that God is not wise or powerful or good. J.I. Packer says, meekness is trusting God's plan and accepting what comes because it's because it is in his plan, and relying on God's faithfulness to work out the plan. Romans 8.28 says, For we know that those who love, for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So the most important way we can direct our meekness is towards God. But meekness is also... Humility, it's not thinking too highly of yourself. Tim Keller has a famous quote, uh, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. It's getting out of your own head. Another commentator said, everyone wants to be a servant, but no one wants to be treated like one. The challenge is that we not take ourselves so seriously. To not be overly sensitive Overanalyzing what people might think of us. Having an inferiority complex or a superiority complex. Both are oriented in at us. They're both a focus on the self and they're both ultimately about pride. Proverbs 25, 6 and 7 gives this cogent advice that Jesus echoes later, I think in Luke. It says, do not put yourself forward in the presence of the king or stand in the place of the great. For it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. Meekness can actually help you. Don't overestimate your importance. You might find out some uncomfortable truths. (laughs) A.W. Tozer says, Jesus calls us to his rest, and meekness is his method. The meek man cares not at all who is greater than he. For he has long ago decided that the esteem of the world is not worth the effort. It's also, meekness is also not self-defensive. Again, Tozer. The meek man will attain a place of soul rest. As he walks on in meekness, he will be happy to let God defend him. The old struggle to defend himself is over. He has found the peace which meekness brings. This sounds like Moses in Numbers 12. God protects him. God defends him. He doesn't worry about it for himself. Next, meekness when we deal with others. Meekness helps us bear with the sins and shortcomings of others. Because we have sin, but we're also surrounded by sinners. And we have to remember both those things. Those are both important when we deal with Every, every interaction and every conflict that we can come into. There's two sinners involved at minimum, right? And I think we can think, well, I don't want to be at the head of a parade. I'm meek. Like, I'm fine. 
but if you're a mother or a father, just have 10 minutes of your kids refusing to be able to find or tie their shoes, refusing to go along with your schedule, your almighty dictates, and how quickly does your meekness and gentleness start to erode. Our kids are great indicators of our need to grow in meekness. 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25 shows us what our disposition should be like. It says, The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. So that's a slight variation, but it's meekness in the, in the New King James or in the King James. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Think again how how mighty that meekness can operate. If you are meek with correcting even your opponents, perhaps they will come to repentance and a knowledge of the truth. John Chrysostom says, nothing is more powerful than meekness. For as fire is extinguished by water, so a mind inflated by anger is subdued by meekness. By meekness we practice and make known our virtue. And also cause the indignation of our brother to cease and deliver his mind from agitation. What if our brother is caught in a serious sin? How are we supposed to interact with that person then? Galatians 6, 1 tells us. And you should be noticing a theme. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Or meekness, like the King James. And for this reason, I think we should honor meekness when we see it in others. Because meek people are not seeking to honor themselves. We should honor others when we see that meekness. In fact, that's exactly what Peter commands husbands to do in 1 Peter 3, verse 7. So just a couple verses down. Uh, from the, the exhortation for wives. It says, Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Show honor. Romans 12.10, outdo one another in showing honor. There shouldn't be the temptation in us to hoard glory and honor for ourselves. We should be giving it away liberally. We should desire to honor those who in meekness resist that desire to dominate, to have strength that is out of control. Good fathers use their strength to protect their household. And they meekly bear with the many weaknesses and difficulties of family life. They deserve honor for this. One last example. I said I would talk about a meek king. I've been reading, uh, there's a book called The White Horse King. It's about King Alfred, the Great of England. Uh, He's the only English king with the title The Great in it, so you know he did something. He was actually the last Christian king in a divided England. England had like five or six major uh, kingdoms at the time. Uh, This is the 800s. And all, all the other kingdoms had been conquered by the invading Danes, the pagan Norsemen. They had taken over England, and only the kingdom of Wessex was left. And Alfred was the youngest of five brothers, so there's no shot that he's going to be involved in any of this. He's the baby of the family, the runt of the litter, and lo and behold, one by one, all his older siblings die, and now the kingdom falls to Alfred, and he has to defend the last Christian kingdom in England. He ends up at a low point, losing a major battle, and he has to flee to the swamplands in the, in the, the know-nothing region of Wessex, uh, living on an island surrounded by a swamp, fearing what the Danes would do. Because when the Danes caught an English king, they would devote him to their pagan gods, and that usually meant flaying them alive and humiliating them in a humiliating, gruesome, bloody death. 
as an example to the rest of the people that they are conquering not to mess with them. That was, war was part of their religion. Like, that was what they did. This is how they conducted themselves. And somehow, in the providence of God, Alfred goes from hiding on an island in a swamp with just a handful of people to retaking England, and his sworn enemy, Guthrum, the Viking uh, chief that he's been fighting against, he gets him pinned down, and Guthrum surrenders. So now what does Alfred do? His hated enemy that's taken over his homeland is in his hand. So he devotes him to his god. But he doesn't follow a pagan god. He follows the Christian god. So how do you devote someone to the Lord? You baptize them. So he baptizes his enemy. It's a bloodless giving over to God because the blood's already been shed. And beyond that, he pledges to become Guthrum's godfather, which in that era essentially meant he was adopting Guthrum as a son. Think of the meekness of King Alfred the Great in this moment. He could crush his enemy, and instead he adopts him as a son. When Guthrum was baptized, he wore a robe of white. He was given a new name, Ethelstan. And he renounced Satan, professed faith in Christ. And he had joined his adopted father for 12 days of feasting at the king's mead hall, at the king's table. Alfred made his greatest enemy his son and welcomed him into his home. As far as we know, Guthrum, now Ethelstan, was loyal to the king the rest of his life. Alfred is then famous for uniting and inheriting all of England. He literally inherited the land, which brings us to the promise at the end, that last part of the, of the verse. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Here is the paradox. It doesn't feel like the, the, the meek normally inherit much of anything. Jeremiah the prophet laments, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? But this promise is important. And what's interesting is, for this beatitude at least, Jesus is directly quoting out of the Old Testament. We read it this morning in our call to worship from Psalm 37, verse uh, 7 through 11. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourselves over the one who prospers in his way over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Meekness wants to inherit the land. But how do you want to win the world? How do you want to inherit the land? Surely, in some sense, this promise is for the new heavens and new earth. It will only be fully realized at that point. But Alfred really did inherit England. How did he do it? He did it meekly and with God's help. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Our dominion comes to us as an inheritance, not because of who we are in ourselves. It comes by something that J.R. Tolkien called a you catastrophe. A you catastrophe, you know what a catastrophe is. A you catastrophe is a good catastrophe. It's a sudden good turn. It's a plot twist that no one saw coming. A crucifixion and then a resurrection. That's the plot twist that no one saw coming. The meek one, Jesus, inherits the earth. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, to the meek king. His victory is ours if we are in him. If that death that he died is for us. He defeated sin and death, and his enemies are brought before him. And in him, God accepts us and gives us a share. He makes his enemies his sons and daughters. But only if we will be 
humble before him. 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. We inherit from our Heavenly Father, as Romans 8 tells us. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Alfred's heart was shaped by his God. He made his enemy his son. That is the work of a father. Why be meek? Because Jesus is. Instead of destroying us, his one-time enemies, he was gentle and lowly. He has won us to himself. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him as an inheritance, and we should honor and worship him alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that you are our God. We pray that we would be bridled and tamed and put under your leading and your guidance. Help us not think so highly of ourselves, but instead think highly of Christ, the meek king who died to save his enemies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The song. Please extend your hands to receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. We'll have a few announcements. Just have a few announcements to go over with everybody. Um, First, as you can see in your bulletin, um, we are going to have a summer fellowship hour, both in July and August. And um, 
there is need for folks to supply snacks to assist with setup, and in particular, uh, cleanup help is, is uh, needed. So please see Emily Rudy, uh, or you can use the um, QR code and sign up that way. Um, secondly, um, Kingdom Kids starts this week, and there is a need for a Polaroid or instant camera. Um, so if you do have one and you would be of, uh, and you would allow them to use it for that time period, please see Tammy Bernaducci for that. Um, thirdly, um, there is a meeting today after the service up on the third floor. Um, it starts at 1110. It's just for 20 minutes, so it's a short meeting. And it's for those that are current participants and leaders in small groups. If you can't make today's meeting, uh, there will be one also on the last Sunday of this month. Um, so please, if you're a current participant or leader in a small group, please try to attend one of those. Um, there's also an opportunity for an outreach in Ephrata through Evangelism Explosion. Um, Shabu, Reverend Shabu will be here, and he is bringing um, 14 uh, teenagers here that he'll be training over the summer. And he particularly wants to do an outreach here in Ephrata with them, but he would like us to join with them. Um, to do that, and that is on June 29th, which is a Saturday. It starts here at 9.30. You don't need any uh, training at all for this. Um, you can just go along and shadow if you want and watch the students in Shabu as they um, do Evangelism Explosion right here in our community. Um, please keep in, in mind um, those folks that are under the Family Matters. Please keep them in your prayers this week. And lastly, and maybe most importantly, um, there's coffee and long, long johns in the back for all, um, all dads, uh, brothers, uncles, grandfathers, for all men. Um, they're in the back. Unfortunately, I was told there's not enough for the ladies. So, um, <laughs> sorry, ladies. Um, so, um, with that, we're going to dismiss the men first. Um, so that they can go and enjoy uh, their coffee and long johns. So with that, have a blessed uh, Lord's Day. Thank you.